welcome to the education channel. Ask you as a young person, what were your interests and how and when did you actually decide to undertake your field of study? You know, uh, when I was, I guess, growing up in the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. I was the first trimester graduate. In of the, the La Salle University. Of La Salle. I was yes. the first trimester. So when I graduated, I physically finished schooling in 82. Yes. But I couldn't, I guess what you do, the marching and the graduation until 83. Yes. Anyway, uh, back in the early 80s, jobs were very difficult here in the Philippines. Jobs were very difficult that I was forced to leave the country. So where did you actually... I went to the United States, you know, where most people go. I went to the United States mm -hmm. and worked. Uh, I went to Texas. I went to Houston, Texas. And I worked uh, evenings, uh, what do you call that, graveyard shift in restaurants, trying to assimilate myself, mm -hmm. you know, in a new country. And back then, in Texas, Texas Instruments yeah. was starting to become really a name when it comes to electronics Instrumentation. And, and ICs, integrated circuits. So we, I, kept on, I kept on reading about it in newspapers. And that's how I got into electronics is I kept on reading Texas Instruments. But then you had an engineering background. No, I was in business. Okay, so, but okay. then you were just so very interested in this particular field of electronics because, because of Texas Instruments. In Texas, there was also NASA mm -hmm. and all that. So I got really interested in anything technical, you can say, okay. or anything that involves technology. At the same time, my father, who was in the Philippines, mm -hmm. was given the assignment by Enrique Zobel to manage IMO. Yes, semiconductor industry. Semiconductor. It's very, the timing was very, I guess, uh, very strange, but it was timely. So I called my dad, I said, Dad, I know you're doing that semiconductor and electronics. Mm -hmm. What is it all about? After a few months, I asked to come back to learn about electronics. So was this in 1985? 86. 85, 86. Yeah, so this is just uh, at the cost of like the change in the political administration. Yeah, mm -hmm. I came back here. I wanted to learn all about electronics mm -hmm. here in IMI in Suka area. In Suka. I learned. I learned the semiconductor, how chips were packaged. Through you know, on the job training. Through all the training. Yes, because you had no concept of framework from your theoretical study yeah. in school. So that was my first lesson. Mm -hmm. I'll tell to the students, always learn. Yes. Always find things, at least for myself, I was interested in technology. Yeah, I was not an engineer, but I was interested, so I wanted to learn. So I looked for it, I went for it. I was fortunate my dad was running yeah. IMI. Mm -hmm. I got a chance to learn. So can you say, sir, that what you don't know, you can always learn? You can learn. It is what you have is your motivation to learn. So I was here for six or seven months. I cannot remember, but it was less than a year. Mm -hmm. After that, I went back. I went back to the United States. Mm -hmm. I left Texas and I went to New Jersey or New York. I worked, I worked for an electronics company. Mm. Battle Precision. They make uh, packages, magnetic packages. And it so happened our customer was Texas Instruments. It was a very strange uh, set of events and coincidences. So, I learned electronic components. I learned how to make electronic mm -hmm. packages. For medical packages, are glass sealed packages. They're used for the medical science. Uh, they they were used for uh, defense. I just call it defense. <laughs> they were used for defense. So I got very interested. And then I saw an opening in Canada. 
that needed hermetic experience, which I had. So I migrated to Canada really? with, with my family, you know, okay. so to Toronto. 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 So by then, that's how my electronics interest came about. I went to Toronto to work for ITT, still electronics, but now in the military aerospace. So I was with Boeing, McDonald. Back then it was McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed Martin. Biggest defense industry. <laughs> so that's how it all started. Mm. Then from Toronto, I went to Montreal. I lived there because I just moved and moved. Um, Montreal, and then to Boston, and then to Europe, China. Then in 2003, I got that, I guess, faith call. Mm -hmm. It was my father. You should in, come back to the in 2003 my father said we're going to set up a company first i thought he was already retired so yeah from, from IMI, right? yes he's already retired so i thought we were going to set up a company because he was a part-time farmer back already mm -hmm. hobby farm okay. we have a gentleman farm. farmer <laughs> yes that's it we had our papaya pineapple and where was this in batangas in Malba. Yes. <laughs> so by then, I thought, where did you find a spot to sell your produce? <laughs> yes. Because we're going to set up a company. I guess. That's what you thought. That you're serious. <laughs> you're serious. You set this up. Yes. By then, I was, I had the Boston factory, Montreal factory, mm -hmm. with electronics. Then I was managing in Europe and also in China. Mm -hmm. Electronics. So just kept on learning and learning and learning until you just don't stop learning. Exactly. And that's how I, you know, that's how I, I think, I believe that's how you move up the ladder. So what do you think would have been the skills, competencies, and experiential learning that you had learned all throughout this career trajectory of yours that should be uh, very crucial if you wanted to be in the field of electronics for example? The first or thing technology. The first thing I really wanted is to run my own factory. I I I still had the business sense or that's where exactly. that's what I took in college and that's what I really wanted to do. So mm -hmm. I wanted to run my own factory or my own shop. So I asked my so VP's presidents, what does it take? And they gave me a shopping list. <laughs> You need to do this. You yes. Need to do that. You need international experience. You need this, which I went through the whole regiment, from HR to manufacturing to production to product development, account management, customers. I went through the even accounting. So would you agree, sir, that it takes ten thousand hours just to have? Uh, the skill set that you require to be on top of your game? No, add another zero. Yes, <laughs> add another zero, right? You might need to add another 100,000 hours. Exactly. But uh, what I would suggest is really have your passion. Find your passion, go after it, and then continue learning. Uh, when you tour our factory here, my father used to say that uh, uh, Training makes ordinary workers produce extraordinary results. Until now, until now, I'm still training. Yes. Until now, mm -hmm. I'm still learning. Uh, I'm gonna put up satellite internet via satellite here very soon in the Philippines. So mm -hmm. I'm learning yes. about satellites. Yes. <laughs> I'm learning about whatever speed is internet. You know, for me, internet is you turn on your computer or your mobile phone. If it's there, it's there. If it's not there, there's no internet. But apparently, there are speeds involved here. Exactly. And, and so we have to move further <laughs> beyond so that. So now, even as a senior citizen, I have to learn all this. So learning really never stops. I continue, learning. continue doing. So when I got that faithful call, it was in the fall, actually. And I was in Boston, and my dad Maybe. said, my dad said we're gonna set up a company. Then, no, no, this is already 2003. 
fast forward, it's 2003 when, when he phoned, he said, Barry, we're going to set up a company. I said, dude, congratulations, go ahead. <laughs> no, we're going to set up an electronic company. I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> You're retired, you got to be kidding. And I knew what he was saying. We're going to set we are going to set and so you did join your father so i think i remember i came back i think two or three weeks after that call just to make sure that he wasn't drunk <laughs> or he was really serious and he was <laughs> then when my father said you know perry in 2003 china yes very very so there was a lot of exiting electronic assembly the United States from Europe, here, Philippines to China, Europe. US to China, everywhere, including Philippines to China. And when my father heard about electronic companies moving work from Philippines to China, he couldn't accept it. He said the Philippines could compete with China. Somebody said, I won't mention, but somebody said, if you think you can compete, why don't you set up a company and show it? That's how it's So now fast forward. So with 89 people, or 86, 89, they started EMS. Leased space, borrowed laptops, all used, it started. And they were able to prove. So from 89, now we're close to 19,000. And we have branched out to Tessis Group, <laughs> which is the training and development, working with students, the academy, so different. So when you talk about like your career trajectory from actually like working in corporate, I guess, in the mm -hmm. industry and then now into entrepreneurship, how would you differentiate um, your skill set and the passion that you put into the venture? You know, um, I had several questions. How did it, how did you make it in the United States where very few of your color or race have made it in the field dominated? This is electronics, military, aerospace. These are for the white people, for the Americans. And how could you run factories? I said, you know, right from the get go, I felt discrimination, but it shouldn't let it affect you. And, you know, whether you deserve it or not, it's just, it's just there. In fact, we even have it here in the Philippines, discrimination. But there's a lot of, I guess, non, non, uh, non-American who always feel bad about discrimination in this. You know what? It doesn't matter. You, know? you, you take a pragmatic view yeah. of what the conditions are, and then you start from there. That was the first lesson I said, you know, you shouldn't let other people affect you. I was told in board meetings, my name was there, Perry Ferrer, but coming from Canada, they think it was I was French. <laughs> what? When I sat down, like yes, not, it's not for you, sir. You couldn't see it. I said, it's the guy. It's the guy. I said, sorry. But that was it. You know, when you're walking down Fisherman's Wharf, I brought my team, my team, who worked for me, for me, all Americans and, and Europeans. Somebody in the street said, Filipino said, I smiled. I said, don't worry, I won't. You know, if you let things like that affect you, you will not. It will eat you up. It will eat you up. So here, you just have your goal. You go for it with passion. You learn. And as you're learning, you know, uh, one thing I always say, I wasn't too worried about how much they paid me. I was always happy where I work. <laughs> Rain, snow, sleep. So it still the 100,000 hours <laughs> is what it would take. Until actually. now. 
<laughs> when you're running this company here in this group before covid i was here at 6 15 in the morning same time when i was in america you i took the time to talk to people on my own time and so it's often that, the case that when you're on top of your game it's like you have to talk to at least 20 people every single day <laughs> i cherish that moment between 6 15 or 6 15 and 8 o'clock before everybody comes to be with people now that it's covid i moved it up to seven because there is nobody here because, <laughs> because they they wouldn't come but uh if you are really passionate about what you're doing you know you just do it i come in here eyes open expecting problems and i embrace it i'm afraid that there's no issues somebody's hiding something from me <laughs> so i expect a stack of problems and it's go with one by one all the challenges i feel you know at least where i sit i'm excited to go to work every day every day every day knowing that there are problems so at the very end what would your advice be to young people right now who are on the cusp of making that life possibly life-changing decision as to what field of study they should undertake and the other one is what kind of career should they be aspiring for you know uh one thing is you gotta do what you love to do you you really have to because it gives you the motivation to do everything you want to do without being told you have to do it because if you do not want if you do not like if you don't have the passion on what you're doing regardless if you're a lawyer or you're a doctor you won't do it whatever it is that you decide regardless what you decide you need to have the passion and once you have that nothing is going to stop you nothing absolutely nothing is going to stop you uh, from so doing it's actually that. limitless <laughs> Uh, and then my next one is uh I'll talk about money later on but <laughs> learn 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 you know when we got hit by the pandemic almost two years january february 2020 so you had to stop all of these learning services right? it was so difficult for creotech creotech test teaches me on what to do with uh, three of them. but we were not prepared we had so much business continuity plans but not for this totally out of left <laughs> absolutely disrupted because we've gone through many market changes disruptions but not a global disruption everything stopped if we were not ready then there is the people side the emotional side of the people there is the business side then there is you know, what will happen to the business what will happen and back then we had like 16,000 it was difficult that was the most difficult finding work having to change all our schedules to give opportunities to each one at least work a few days a week to get uh, so funds yeah. to sustain your so, no nothing prepared us all of us nothing prepared us for that now it hardened us that's the good thing yes every director every manager learned you know there were some difficult times but we all learned that's why you shouldn't stop learning and then now work from home online this yeah. digital this oops so you test did all this 360 yeah. 180 thing and digital it's a brave new world <laughs> the same with us 
try to play action. So we had to find ways and how to operate with a third less people who we couldn't have here because IATF said no. Yes. Multi-skill, yes. move that person there, move that person there. Oops, you're good at this pala. Dito ka na lang. Yeah. So, it was so now you're moving. actually having a different skill set uh, for people to be uh, trained yes. on. And at the same time, you're also giving them different responsibilities and functions that they otherwise did not actually do before, right? That is what happened. That is what happened, actually. We all learned what we could learn, what we could do. It would stretch our skills, it would stretch our, I guess, uh, you know, I won't call it uh, brain. I don't know, I'm not an expert on that, but I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, we were here day and night. Before the, before the community family was popular late last year, the, the people already had it here. Uh, this is where you see the compassion of people. We had uh, we had uh, tables there where employees can bring in their extra whatever, cup of noodles, sardines, food. Uh, one of our directors had chickens, hundreds of chickens in their chicken place. He brought eggs, three, four hundred. So the employees just got. And you know what was good? They only got what they needed. Right? So when you see that, so again, you see that adversity is actually what makes the character of the people. <laughs> it shows. It shows. It was come up. So I think from your um, inspiring story, what would be your vision now for the future of like EMS group for one? EMS, we have 20,000. Pretty soon, by Q1 next year, we'll breach the 20,000 employees. Which is good. We give There's employment. A There's a scale we give economic, employment. There's economic impact. Which is our first, uh, which is our first priorities to provide employment. But what we want to do as heads, we want to see less and less minimum wage workers. We have, a sig we, we, have a sig we have a significant amount of minimum wage work. For them. But in order to give me a reason to get them out of that, they have to upskill. So now we have a big program of upskilling, digitalization, using data, data to drive management, to use data. And if you use technology now to really not just superficially but really run your business to improve the twenty thousand employees that we will have fairly soon can produce probably thirty percent more because you're optimizing yes. the resources they're more efficient they're more productive mm -hmm. imagine same number of employees producing thirty percent more then i have a good reason to give them more then they would need us killing. The, the recent research that I did with the full bike was actually to look into the community college model based on the US and the Canadian model mm -hmm. because that is where they would have the possibility of staff credential, which we still don't have in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So that's hopefully something that we can look forward to in the future. Like they can undertake first something of a particular specialization, let's just say welding, for mm -hmm. example, which is a low skill set. And then that becomes the initial entry level for your staff credentials. Then after six months, maybe you can improve it to like mechatronics, for yes. example, under the TESTA. And then the TESTA should have an equivalency towards an associate degree in the community college, which is under the Commission on Higher Education. Because um, I studied the model of the state of Tennessee. They had the drive to 55. Um, that was conceptualized in 2005 and envisioned until 2025, where 55% of the state's population should have a post secondary educational credential. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a baccalaureate degree or a full blown degree. It no. could be the stack credentials that you move up uh, in terms of like upscaling from the entry level to the medium 
comes the teaching range skill set, and then eventually, of course, the degree uh, set, associate mm-hmm. degrees, and eventually, the upper degrees. So that's, maybe a good that's, a, that's a possible model that could be adopted. Because here we're we're really pushing for we I wanna pay for the skill set. Yes, definitely. And you know, I've taken out the rule in the past there were rules that in order for you to be a supervisor or a first you level to be a bachelor's yes, degree uh, that out. so we took that out. <laughs> and uh, we have a technical ladder system, not necessarily engineering, but technical skill set. Because what we found which is bad, in order to get paid more, a lot of the people think they have to be a manager. And the word manager is being overused. So I said, no, you don't have to be the manager to be here. So you can move up the ladder. And in fact, in, in my prior life, there were a few people who got paid significantly more than me. And I was already a group general manager. Yes. And they were not skills. they were not even managers. And I had no problem with it because they made my life easier. So I think that's potentially yeah, that's that's part that needs to happen like in the yeah. Philippines, right? <laughs> so I want I want here, we're gonna start it here and you know, even though in the highest position in the company, or I own the company. Have to be the highest paid guy. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to be the highest paid. Because there is a lot, much better people than me. My responsibility is ensuring that the company will be here bigger, better, more profitable. And in the next 20, 30 years, and to have a succession plan. Yes. And, but in terms of pay, other people can have it. And, and that's what we want to instill to the people that, you know, if you have the skill, and we pay by skill, and that's what we want to push and push and push. So our, we used to call it human resource department, but they call it now people department. So they're, they're putting that program on the place but i want to tell the youth learn forget the pay first uh i know it's difficult to say i know it's difficult i understand that it's so easy for me to say but i was there i was there if i was worried about what i was gonna pay i wouldn't be here now or i wouldn't have gone where uh on all the my training and where i went I did a lot of lateral positions, harder, just to learn. And once I got all my badges, that's when you <laughs> I didn't even have to ask. They moved here. You want it? Hey, which is, uh, I think uh, I, I, I mentor that to people. And the same with here, we have a lot of in fact, we need more, but there's a lot of success stories here. They used to be minimum wage operators. They're now managers. And we want more of that. You don't have to come from a green university or a blue university or this, but you can, you can, you can actually develop human capital. Uh, one of our bigger programs now is developing data people. So I have scholarships to develop data administrators, data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, and data managers. So we have that. Uh, hopefully, we'll start in January. So Is that a completely different company? No, no, here. Uh, no, no. I have employees that will get into that. I'm working with a development academy in the Philippines that they have all those courses. So we were able to put together agreements that industry employees industry employees are able to get that type of learning because if we want to go digital Definitely. if we want to go technology we have to have the data administrators yes. the data the different data sets 
of people, all the way up to data scientists and data engineers, yeah. because we do manufacturing. I want to create teams that just analyzes people. What is the best combination of skill sets to be able to produce? And we have so many, the Philippines has so many graduates. Nasayang lang, we're not in the right. Yeah, it's actually. So there's like a mismatch. Actually, that was like my field of specialization in Japan. <laughs> yeah, was there. They, uh, this is analytics. <laughs> so now that we're trying to, uh, there's a group that we're trying to, I won't say fix, but we're trying to make that gap closer. And AIM now has a doctorate in data science that they're offering. It's a three-year program that they have right now. And actually, the professors there originated from the physics department originally, right? And, but now it's moving towards the business analytics. I, I'm, we're cutting the, when it comes to data, there's still, we have the, from the operation side, from the production side. Yes. A lot of data, billions yeah. here. Probably. Exactly. Then we have the human data. resource data. It's qualitative want, and quantitative. Because I want our team to, because of just the sheer number of employees that we have. We can already draw up a study. <laughs> we can have a profile. Of the right person at the right place, at yeah. the right department, exactly. at the right shift. Yes. I don't want. People trying to think, ah, no, no, ayan, pwede nga yan siya dyan, lagyan mo sa second shift. But I absolutely don't like that. It is a science, actually. That's what I believe. It is a science. So I want to create that. So it helps our supervisors or managers to come up with, okay, so this is what data says. Let me try. Yeah. Yeah. Empirical based decision making, and so far as staff is concerned. Very fast. In the HR study, the human research, very fast. I need a team to do this. Who Here's the profile. Then that. they would suggest. Put it again. Because you have the scale already in terms of the employees and the skill sets that they need. Because I want to put all the skill sets of our employees into a database. And then the combination of the different engagements we have would bring out. So the I think that would be like so innovative for the Philippines because we haven't yet been able to do that. That is right. Right? If you can actually have like a talent or skill set map of the people in your company and then that's you have to set the empirical set, data set. That's what we're, that's our objective in the next few years, three years, to help help the managers or whoever is deciding this is a good set of skills to be now regardless of the name here it, here they are i mean for manage uh, for management decision making it's a tool it's a most effective tool for management so that's where we're heading now uh we're, we're gonna use technology not to get rid of people but we're gonna use technology to improve optimize the people and then put them in the right place, more productive, more efficient, more okay. paid. So are you happy that you had actually returned to the Philippines from all of your securities <laughs> outside to the Philippines? And so the, said, the impact is concerned. The answer is, in the first year, I wasn't sure. But now, I'm absolutely sure. Uh, when you break off that relationship with the, with the country, you leave everything there. So we all came back. Like what it is, you know, you've heard many people say, you just came back with your suitcase, that's it. That's what I do. Start from zero. If you bring your luxuries here, it's not going to work. I left everything. Everything. Because you can start over again. Yeah. Which the first two years I learned about the Philippines and its people. Because I've been out of the country for 22 years. I don't know what Filipinos are like anymore. So you had to re acculturate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to know what are the characteristics of 
our employees, what are their quirks, and the motivations. <laughs> which is, so it took me two years to learn that and experience it. I fell on my face a few times. I was my North American mentality doesn't work totally here. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> It used to be very blunt. Oops. Emotional. But I, Madam Dami. They're very sensitive and they keep it for months. About months. Months. Right, yes. But, you know, you learn. Definitely. And at the end of the day, uh, what I can say is nice to be home. So a parting message to the young people and to the future of our country. You know, to the young people in front of you, there's a great future in front of you. Uh, the future, uh, the past I grew up with is not going to be the same or where you're going to go. The future is with technology. The future is significantly brighter uh, for the younger people now. So please learn and continue learning and uh, help people. Share. Share what you have. Share what you've learned, uh, whether you mentor or you coach. It could be monetary. Just help our Kapwa Philippines. It's very important, especially when you are in a position that you could we should do. So we are driven here by our SDGs. My wife's here, uh, yeah. who heads up our sustainable development goals. We saw the uh, SDG wall, <laughs> and that is that is what drives our decision. That's what drives my decision. Absolutely, absolutely. The SDG program is how we can help and how we can improve the livelihood of the Filipinos. Not only in our company, but nationally. Uh, we have a lot of programs that we engage with in other industries to help. So, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you learn, then you help. You learn, then you teach. You learn, then you mentor. So, uh, and it's so nice to be able to do that. So, I have my EMS time, then I have my other time, which is 60% actually. <laughs> More than the time that you're spending with yeah, the company. Because uh, here, you build good people, competent people around you. So you can delegate. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> it will they, we had difficult, we had great beginning and we went through a difficult time because of legislation. But if you have confidence in the team that we have, we have three of them. We turn it around, we prove it, They've shown it, and then they continue. Just have a good team around you, good mentorship, and just spread your knowledge. And of course, leadership. what you provide is the leadership. So a little bit there, they're good. <laughs> yeah, good. So thank you so much for the inspiration, actually, um, that you provide to the EMS group of companies. So Mr. Perry Perel, president of the EMS group of companies. Thank you so much. For thank you for visiting. Time. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat and Thank you. Thank you, sir.